It's Windy Miller. Hello, Windy. Are you busy? Plenty of corn to grind? Plenty of wind in your sails? Ah, yes, they're going nicely, aren't they? Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to 2023. Well, I hope all of you had a good Christmas, and I will just wish you a rather belated but happy new year. My apologies, it's been quite a while since I last released a video. I did plan to put some videos out over the Christmas period, but me, along with the rest of the UK, everybody seems to be suffering from a rather nasty cold and flu bug. So, as you can probably hear, I'm still a little bit stuffed up, still coughing, still sneezing, but hopefully I've got my voice back and you can at least hear what I'm saying now. Now, for those of you that have seen my other videos, you'll know that I've got quite a lot of interest in test gear, new test gear and vintage test gear, and I've also got quite a lot of interest in things like valve radios, and you've seen me doing quite a few radio restorations over the last few years. But for 2023, I've decided to make a slight change of tack. We are still going to be looking at test gear and electronics, but I think this year I'm going to concentrate on mainly doing new projects. And on my list of New Year's resolutions, I decided that I actually wanted to learn KiCad so that I can actually publish some open source electronics designs because that's something that I'm interested in doing. I'd like to do a little bit more with software. Now, I've been working with software and various computer languages for pretty much the last 30 years, but I don't claim to be any kind of expert because I actually write software very infrequently. But this year I have decided to learn a relatively new programming language which is called Python. Now the Python language has been used on PCs and servers and lots of other applications that mainly go on big computers. It's been used for quite a few years but more recently it started to be used for microcontrollers and that's more what I'm interested in. So this year we are going to learn a little bit of micro Python. I also want to do quite a few more construction projects this year. I want to do more with Fusion 360 and get a bit better at 3D modelling. And I also want to do some 3D printing, which is something that I enjoy. Along with that, we'll be doing some work in the garage on the lathe and the milling machine. So we're going to be getting our hands dirty this year. Good afternoon to you. Earlier on today, apparently a woman rang the BBC and said she heard that there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. But having said that... 13 die as hurricane force winds sweep southern Britain. Storm Arwen is hitting the UK on Friday night and it's prompted a rare Met Office red warning. 74 people were rescued in blizzard conditions late last night. Some had been stuck for over eight hours. The Met Office have issued a red extreme heat warning. Well, unless you've been living on the moon, I'm guessing much like me, you've got weather. Well, here in South Yorkshire, where I live, we tend to have quite a lot of weather. Unfortunately, most of it's bad. The subject of weather, or more precisely, meteorology. Metology? Metology? Oh, what is it? Metro... Oh, crap. Um, oh, I'm going to have to look So I've decided that our first project for this year is going to be building an automated weather station because that exposes us to lots of interesting and exciting sensor technologies. So with the aid of the Bosch SensorTech BME280, I intend to measure temperature, humidity and barometric pressure. Now the BME280 is a little tiny module. It's about the size of a match head and it communicates using the I squared C serial bus. So we also get to play with some serial communications in the form of I squared C. Now although the sensor itself is absolutely tiny, it actually delivers very good performance. It's got a temperature range between minus 40 and plus 85 degrees. Humidity is between 20 and 80 percent and it can measure barometric pressure between 300 and 1100 hectopascals. Let's just call it millibars. On the hillside surrounding where I live, in the last few years they've actually installed quite a number of wind generators and I have to say that since their installation it has got a lot windier. In fact, Barnsley is now totally self-sufficient in wind and we've actually been exporting it to faraway countries as far as Lancashire. Given that I do suffer so badly from wind, 
Wind speed measurement is something that's quite important. There is various types of wind speed measurement devices, but the one that we're going to build today is a cup type anemometer. And to make a wind speed measurement, we've got to see how quickly the cups in our anemometer rotate. And to do that, we're going to look at an RPM encoder, or as they're more commonly called, an incremental encoder, of which there are different types. And we're going to take a look at some of those today. I would also like to know the direction in which the wind is coming from. And to do that we need another type of encoder, which is called an absolute encoder. And the type that we're going to be looking at is called a grey code or reflected binary encoder. Living in Barnsley, I've never actually seen the sun myself, but I once met a man that had. So we will also be trying to measure the sun's brightness throughout the day. But when it comes to rain, we are very experienced and we're going to be building a tipping bucket rain gauge so we can measure rainfall too. In order for our various sensors to collect the weather data, the weather station must be installed outside. And in my case, I plan to install it at the very bottom of my garden. Now, having collected all that data, I need to do something with it and what I plan to do is to try to upload it to the web but before I do that I've got to get the data from the weather station back to the house onto a computer and then onto the internet so what we need to do is some telemetry. Well in order to transmit and receive the RF data or telemetry you can see that I've actually just gone ahead here and from Amazon and also eBay I've gone ahead and I've actually purchased some of these pre-built little modules so you can see we've actually got several different types here so we've got different power outputs we've also got different frequencies and some of them have different types of interfaces in the way that we're going to control them. In my working life, I do have a little experience of RF telemetry. And one thing that I learned very early on is that whatever the manufacturers of these modules claim, they never actually work as well in the real world as they claim to on the data sheet. So what I actually plan to do is we're actually going to take each of these RF transmitters and receivers and we're going to hook them up and we're going to do some range testing and we're also going to see how much power they consume because at the end of the day my weather station has to run off batteries and we've only got so much power available to actually run these transmitters and receivers so we're going to be doing some experiments with that too. And speaking of batteries, we are of course going to need some way of powering our weather station and all those sensors. Now I haven't decided what we're going to use. You can see that I've got a selection here. I've got some LiPo batteries here. I've got some 18650s and I've also got some of these flat LiPo cells which are actually quite small. But I'm also quite interested to try to use super capacitors. Now super capacitors, they're really not ideal for this type of application because they're not actually particularly energy dense. Well, they're not energy dense compared with things like batteries, but just the fact that I've never used super capacitors before, it really does make me want to give them a go. Regardless of the type of energy storage which we use, we're going to need some way of actually charging these things off grid. And to do that, I'm probably going to use something like solar panels. I've got a few different types of solar panels here, but I'm not exactly sure how big a panel we're going to need yet because I'm not sure what the energy consumption of the weather station will be. So we're actually going to do some testing to find that out. And then we're going to decide on a charging method. So that could be solar, or maybe it could be wind powered, or maybe some other method. At the heart of our weather station project, we are going to need some form of control. And I plan to use a relatively new microcontroller, which is the RP2040. And that comes pre installed on the Pi Pico board, which is manufactured by the Pi Foundation. Today there are literally hundreds of different types of microcontroller that we could have chosen and that includes those used on things like the Arduino. But the main reason that I've chosen the Pi Pico and the RP2040 is simply because it can be programmed in MicroPython. And the other reasons include that it's very low cost, you can actually buy one of these Pi Pico boards for less than £6 online. And you can also get them delivered next day via Amazon, which is important for me because I just can't wait. 
because our weather station is going to be operating off grid with the aid of batteries the actual power usage is very important now the actual Pi Pico or the RP2040 it's not particularly low power but we are going to have to look at some power management techniques to try to squeeze as much life out of it as we possibly can so that's going to include turning the thing off putting it into sleep modes and then we're going to have to look at how we can wake it up from its dormant or sleeping state and I do plan on designing and building a printed circuit board for our weather station so again that gives me the opportunity to practice and learn KiCad the final part of our weather station project that I'd like to talk about today is the fact that I'm going to try to make it open source and in this case what open source means is that all the information and materials that I use in the design they're going to be freely available to anyone to use, modify or distribute. So have a look at the show notes to see how you can download the information. I do plan to use open source tools wherever possible and an example of that is that we're going to learn to use KiCad for the printed circuit board design. Now although I do plan to make the project open source where possible I'm not going to make a rod for my own back. So in the case of the 3D modelling, I use Fusion 360. Now Fusion 360 is an Autodesk product. It is licensed and you do have to pay for it. However, Fusion 360 is free for hobby use and non-commercial applications. For the purists out there that want to use free and open source software, I can highly recommend the use of FreeCAD. It really is a very good option. The reason that I'm not using it is because I'm already familiar with Fusion 360 and I just don't have time to learn something new right now. Wherever practical I do intend to release information in as many file formats as possible. In the case of the 3D CAD that's going to include STL, step files and some drawing files which will be in DFX format. Today we're going to start our weather station project with a sensor that can measure the wind speed. And the device that's employed for wind speed measurement is called an anemometer. Now there are several types of anemometer on the market. Some of them are electronic but this one is a mechanical one. And when it comes to mechanical anemometers there's two types. There's the vane type which looks a bit like a propeller or there is also the one that this one is called which is a cup type anemometer and it's called a cup type because you can see it's got these cup shaped half spheres on it. So you can imagine that when these cups rotate they actually trace out a circumference around the circle so the effective diameter is from the centre here to approximately the centre of the cup and as this spins around it will trace a circle. So just imagine now that the effective circumference traced out by these moving cups is about one metre. Now if the wind is actually moving at one metre per second what will happen is our anometer will do one complete rotation in one second. If our wind was going at two metres a second it would actually do two rotations in one second. So all we have to do to approximate the wind speed is actually count how quickly this is turning. We have to count the RPM. Now the reality is when these cups spin round they probably won't go quite as fast as the wind actually does because these cups here they're not going to couple perfectly with the wind. It's not going to push them perfectly. We're also going to get some drag on the side of the cups even though they are quite aerodynamic but of course we're probably also going to have some friction in the bearings here so we're not going to actually get a perfect correlation between wind speed and RPM but it is going to be fairly close so what actually happens is when we've actually got this RPM measurement we'll actually put some correction factors in in the software so we can actually calibrate the thing. On the bench we have our Raspberry Pi Pico and this is a microcontroller. Well to be more correct the actual microcontroller itself is this little square integrated circuit which is at the centre of the board here and this is the RP2040 which is a dual ARM core processor. 
Now, as you can see, there isn't actually very much on this board. It's really the size and shape that it is, just to enable you to actually plug in all the various input and output pins that you need to. There's not that much on it. We've got a USB connector here. So it's like we've got a crystal. We've got a push button here, which is used for downloading the initial program. I think we've also got a switch mode controller somewhere. And on the underside, there's really even less going on. There's pretty much nothing. Now, one thing just to bear in mind, when we actually talk about the input and output pins, they don't necessarily go in logical order. So the pin number isn't actually the same as what they call the GPIO number. Uh, unfortunately, they don't actually put the GPIO numbers on the top of the board. So do be careful when you're connecting up your Raspberry Pi Pico that you don't connect it in error. Um, just for scale here, you can see that we've got just got a one penny piece here. So the whole thing really is pretty tiny. Eventually, we are going to have to connect all our various weather sensors to our Pi Pico board. And luckily, the Pi Pico board has a few different ways of doing that. First of all, we've actually got some analog to digital converters here. So what we can do is we can get voltage inputs from some of the sensors and actually convert them into digital readings. Now, another thing that we can do with our microcontroller here is that computers and microcontrollers, for that matter, they are actually very good at counting things. So really what we need to do with our anemometer here, we need to actually change our revolutions per minute. We need to change them into electrical pulses because then our Raspberry Pi Pico can count those pulses and it can work out how fast the wind is blowing. Now the very easiest way to make an electrical pulse is to use a simple push switch. So we've got one here just connected to my ohm meter. So if I press the switch, we get a bleep. So we're actually generating a pulse. And uh, of course I can increase the number of pulses just by pressing the switch more quickly. But we would have a problem using a simple push switch to actually measure the wind speed because we've actually got a circular motion here and we actually need to transform that into a linear motion. We need to actually push this switch in and out like that. And of course there is ways of doing that, so let's take a look. I think that probably the easiest way to transform our rotary motion into a linear backwards and forward motion to actually activate our switch is to use some form of cam. So I've got a rotor here and you can see I've actually built a cam lobe onto the end of it, the part sticking out. So if I actually rotate this, it's actually going to press our micro switch. So let me just give it a spin. And you can see that every time I rotate the switch here, we get a bleep on the meter as the switch contacts close. But we would have problems if we were trying to implement such a system on our anemometer. Now, some of the problems that we would have is that, of course, the anemometer is going to be constantly spinning. So that's going to create a lot of wear on the switch mechanism and the switch contacts. And it's also going to wear our cam here. So eventually this switch is going to wear out. Now, the other problem that we're going to have is actually when the cam here presses the switch, it's actually has to impart some force to activate the switch. So it generates some friction. So as the switch opens and closes, well, more as it closes, I can actually feel some resistance here. Well, that's going to actually act to slow the anemometer down. And the problem that we've got with that, if we actually slow it down, we're going to get an incorrect wind speed measurement, aren't we? So really, a mechanical switch isn't the perfect thing to use here. Another problem that can occur when trying to use simple mechanical switches like this one is something called switch bounce. Now I said earlier that microcontrollers and computers, they can actually count very, very quickly. They can actually count much quicker than I can press this button. And what you will see on some occasions when the switch contacts actually open and close, they don't actually open and close cleanly. What actually happens is the contacts bounce and rather than getting a pulse, you actually get a series of pulses. If I just freeze the oscilloscope, you should be able to see some of those. So you can see that although I actually only press the button once, you can actually see that we get at least two pulses 
and lots of little pulses here. So our microcontroller, it's quite likely it would have counted all those pulses and that would have given us an invalid measurement of the wind speed. Now whenever you use such crude mechanical switches as this one, you are likely to encounter problems such as this with switch bounce. Now those problems can be overcome with a little bit of low pass filtering using a resistor and a capacitor, or you can also do some debouncing in the software. But really, mechanical switches such as this one, they're not really the ideal thing for generating pulses. Having described the problems of mechanical switches, you'll probably be surprised to learn that they are actually very frequently used in anemometers to actually generate the wind speed pulses. However, they don't use a standard switch. What they actually use is a non-contact reed switch. And I've got an example of one of those on the bench here. Using this penny for scale, you can see that we've actually got a very small glass tube here. And the glass tube is sealed and it's got a set of terminals, one at each end. Now inside that glass tube, we've got a switch contact. But rather than actually a plunger or a push button directly acting on the switch contacts, what operates this switch is a magnet. So if I actually was to bring a magnet close to our switch here, the contacts would close and then when I move the magnet away the contacts will open again. I've taken our reed switch and using a copious amount of blue tack, I've glued it down under the microscope and in the middle of the screen here you can actually see the contacts. Now this little pointer here that I'm holding, it's actually got a little magnet installed on the end of it. So I'm just going to approach the reed switch and we should see these contacts close. So let me do that now. I've taken the reed switch that we saw earlier and I've soldered a couple of wires onto it that allows me to connect it to an electrical supply and it's also connected to an oscilloscope so that we can visualise the pulses that it's generating. Now I've also gone ahead and I've created what is called a rotor. So this is representing our anemometer or the part that spins round here. So you can see that I can just put it onto here like this and I can spin it like that. But if I actually turn our rotor upside down, I guess there's something a little bit clever about it because I've just glued two magnets to the underside of it. So what's going to happen is when this rotor spins around, these magnets are going to travel over the top of the reed switch. They're going to make the reed switch contacts close and that's going to generate an electrical pulse. And we can see that on the oscilloscope. So let's have a look. Let's see if I can give our anemometer a good spin. You can see that we're generating now lots of pulses and as the rotor slows down you can see that the pulses get wider apart. Let's do that again. So although our reed switch arrangement can work very well, in the past I have actually had some problems and needed to repair some anemometers that use this kind of switching arrangement. Now you may think that one of the problems would be that the switch would just wear out and it would actually fatigue from these pieces of metal constantly flexing as the magnet comes close and goes away again. But typically that isn't the failure mode that I've seen. Quite a few of them that you get, you'll actually find the glass envelope here is broken. And what I suspect happens is you get water ingress. When these are manufactured, they're completely sealed, hermetically sealed and watertight. But over a period of time, water can creep into this glass tube via where these leads enter it at each end. And I suspect what happens, maybe on a hot day, this tube pressurises once water's got in and it fractures the glass because I've actually seen quite a number of them that are just shattered. So perhaps a mechanical arrangement like this really isn't a perfect one. Luckily for us, there is actually other forms of magnetic sensors which don't have the disadvantage of our reed switch. And one of those alternatives comes in this transistor package here, which is actually a Hall effect switch. Now a Hall effect switch is a type of transistor, but it's actually sensitive to magnetic fields. The device that we've got here is an A314, and you can see that it's in a transistor UA style package. It's got three pins. Now the first pin is a supply pin, pin one, which can be anywhere between 4.2 and 24 volts and it requires a current of approximately 4 milliamps. Pin two we have to connect to ground. 
and pin 3 here is the output and it's an open collector output so when the transistor detects the presence of a magnetic field this pin is pulled down to ground and the output switching current can be up to 25 milliamps. On the opposite side to our reed switch here I've actually got one of these transistors and again I've glued it down to this piece of plastic and again I'm going to install our rotor with the magnets on the bottom of it and the magnets are going to sweep over the top of the transistor and it's going to switch on and off so let's take a look at that. And you can see that we're getting a lovely square wave. So there are actually several advantages using a Hall effect switch over a reed switch. Now some of those advantages include the fact that there's actually no moving parts in our Hall effect transistor. So the transistor can switch an awful lot faster than a reed switch can. So typically these can switch into the tens of kilohertz without any problem whatsoever. Also because there's no moving parts there's nothing to wear out or fail. So the life of this Hall effect transistor it should be very good, it should be very reliable. But probably more important we can see that we've got absolutely no switch bounce because the transistor does do some onboard signal processing so it actually produces a really nice square wave without any bounce. And another good thing about these Hall effect transistors is they're actually an awful lot cheaper now than trying to buy a reed switch so there really isn't a good reason not to use them. Having taken several minutes to describe the benefits of using a Hall effect transistor like this one, you might be surprised to hear that I decided not to use it in my anemometer design. But the reason that I decided not to use it were really due to mechanical considerations rather than electrical ones. So what I've decided to use is another non-contact system, but rather than being a magnetic system we're actually going to use an optical one. So in my hand here I've got an infrared LED and that's outputting now infrared radiation at a frequency of approximately 940 nanometers. And on the breadboard here I've got an infrared phototransistor. Now much like our Hall effect transistor was sensitive to magnetic fields, this actual infrared phototransistor is sensitive to infrared radiation. And if I point the infrared LED at the phototransistor, it's going to switch on. And you're going to see that on the oscilloscope, so let me do that. Okay, so you can see that the transistor switched on. I'm going to move the LED away, and it switches off. And I'm going to move it back to it, and it switches on again. My Hall effect switch here had two magnets glued to the bottom of the rotor, whereas I've actually designed this optical disc, and this optical disc has actually got 10 slots in it. So what this will do is it will either cover up the phototransistor here, or it's got gaps in it where it will actually expose it to the light from the LED. So let me just go ahead and install that. I've got to try to position the LED quite carefully. A bit tricky because it's all a bit loose. So let's give our encoder wheel a bit of a spin and you can see that we're generating some lovely square waves there. Let's do it again. And you can see because we're not using a mechanical switch we're also not suffering from any switch bounce which is good. Now there was two reasons that I decided to use this optical system instead of using the Hall effect transistor. Now one of them is because I wanted to have a common platform for both the anemometer and also the device for measuring the wind's direction so I could keep all the 3D prints and everything effectively the same because I'm basically very lazy and like to avoid work. But the other reason is because I wanted to generate lots of pulses per revolution. Now the reason that I want to generate 10 pulses is because I want to be able to sample the information from the weather station using the microcontroller as quickly as possible. Now if the wind was blowing very very slowly this disc would be turning very slowly and it's quite possible that with only two magnets I'd have to sample maybe for a very long time, uh, maybe 10 seconds just to make sure that this would do one full revolution. 
Whereas because we've actually got 10 cutouts here, I've only got to sample for a tenth of the time that we would have, for example, just using a single magnet. So I can generate pulses an awful lot faster. And the other thing, it means that I can actually measure wind speeds, which are a, a lot slower. So that's why I decided to go for the optical system. So after what feels like several months of continuous 3D printing, you can see that we've actually assembled enough parts here to put together the anemometer. And I've got to admit, I think this has actually come out quite well so far. I'm actually quite pleased with the prints. Now the hardest things to actually print were these little cups and there's actually a, there's three of them that we've printed off and uh, well it was quite difficult to build the support structure inside the cup here and once I built the support structure it was quite difficult to remove it. If anybody's done any 3D printing they'll know exactly what I'm talking about and these have got fairly thin wall sections because I wanted everything to be as lightweight as possible but they seem to have come out quite well. Now all of these 3D printed parts, I've actually printed these using what they call PLA plastic. Now PLA plastic is actually based on a, I think it's a starch based material, so you could say it's kind of a natural product. And uh, one thing that PLA isn't meant to be very good at is uh, equipment which is going to be installed outside, because the problem with PLA is it tends to absorb a lot of moistures and it gets attacked by UV. So of course we get a lot of moisture in the UK and of course that moisture can get into the plastic and then when it freezes I guess it probably expands it and maybe helps to break it apart. I'm not sure, but the thing about the more modern PLAs, well, PLA in some ways it's not actually a true material because every manufacturer of 3D printing filament they all have their own particular recipe of, of PLA plastic so some work better than others so this is a fairly modern modified PLA plastic whether or not it'll be suitable for long-term use outdoors well to be quite honest I have my doubts but that's all part of the fun and part of the experiment of course if this thing does fall apart or gets damaged it's very easy for me to just print apart but I think if I was going to print this again I would maybe choose another material something like either ABS plastic or maybe one of the new PETG materials in fact it's probably fair to say the main reason that I've used PLA plastic is because that's what I happen to have in the printer and if it fails as I say it doesn't matter we'll just print another one but before we get started with that assembly I think the first job I'm going to do is I'm actually going to drill some holes in the box lid and uh, I'm terrible at marking things out and drilling things accurately so again what I've actually done here is I've just printed myself off a little 3D template here which is a drill template so this drops inside the box here and just locates and in theory I should be able to now drill the perfect holes. Well I'm hoping that I'm going to avoid drilling a hole right through my workbench but let's find out. Okay, hopefully there we've got three perfect holes aligned in the centre of the box. Well, that looks pretty good I think. So the first thing that I need to uh, assemble is actually what I've called this spigot. So this is going to go on top of the box like this and uh, it holds to what, I, again I'm going to call it the top platform. Let me just find that top platform. In fact that's the top platform so this goes inside the box like that. And then that hopefully should screw onto there, something like that. Now before installing the spigot on top of the box, I've got this little 10mm bearing here that we have to install. So I'm going to install this without any finesse. Will it just push in? Oh, actually it did. Let's just give it a bit of a tappy tap tap. Okay, I think that's seated itself okay. And I guess while I am indulging a little bit of tappy tap tap, I've also got the bottom bearing which we need to install. So let's just push that in. should be okay. So my anemometer it's actually built on three platforms which actually have to stack together and they're going to stack together and then be bolted together something like that. So you can see there's a stack of them here. Now to actually hold this together we've got some long M3 bolts. Now you, can, you won't be able to get at one side of these to tighten them up so what I actually did is I've actually 3D printed some hexagon shaped recesses so hopefully when these are uh, 
bolts are installed that the heads of them won't be able to turn inside this recess and that should uh, that should hold everything together while I tighten up the screws but before I do that I can see that there's actually some leftover there's some 3d printer material which is just stuck inside here so I need to just pull that out They fit nicely actually, that's great, better than I thought. Now the reason I have to install these now is because actually this little top platform, this fits against the inside lid of the box so I won't have to get access to these when this actual top bearing support is screwed into place. Is that going to go in? Oh yeah it did, a bit tighter. Yeah, that went together really well, quite pleased with that. So I can now go ahead and I can assemble this bottom platform onto the underside of our box and it's going to hold on to our spigot here using some self-tapping screws so let me go ahead and do that. Okay, I think that's got it with just a little bit of uh, silicon squishing out at the bottom there and of course it is all over my hands but that's only to be expected isn't it? So the next part of the assembly involves putting this uh, rod here, this drive shaft, this is going to go through the bearings which it does as you can see and then we've got this hub here which is going to hold the cups on some spokes and it's going to spin round. Now I've actually got to glue this shaft onto uh, onto the end of this hub and to help me do that what I've done is I've actually roughened up, this shaft is made from stainless steel but I've actually taken a file and I've roughened it up and I've actually put some notches and some cuts into the end of it just to give the adhesive something to actually key into. I'm just going to give it a bit of a wipe because it's probably contaminated with my jammy fingers so I'm just going to go ahead and mix some two-part epoxy now. The epoxy glue that I'm going to be using is made by Aral Dye and it's their instant brand so it's got a 90 second setting time which is actually a little bit quicker than I would prefer so we don't really have a lot of time to assemble this so I've uh, yeah I can't hang about can I? But it doesn't help that it's very warm in my room which makes it set even quicker. Right okay that should be okay. Now I've got to get some of that glue inside this hub. Okay I've done that and I've also just got to be careful just to wipe out any excess because the top of here has got a small collar inside which rests on top of the bearing and I don't want it to be sitting on an uneven surface on top of glue so okay so just wipe that out now. So now we've got to install our rod. I think we're going to need a bit of tappy tap tap again. So hopefully when I assemble my shaft into here now it should actually be able to spin on the bearings. Well it is spinning, it's a little bit stiffer than I uh, hoped, it doesn't exactly free run. I think the problem is these bearings are actually shielded bearings, again they're all I had in stock but the fact that they're shielded, they have like a little metal, well they have a metal shield over the top of them that stops water and debris getting into the centre of the bearing but the problem is that they actually do create a little bit of drag but it's what we had in stock so that's what we've used, hopefully it'll be okay. So that has been about 90 seconds and this epoxy's gone off so I think what we'll do now is I'm going to actually get these uh, these little ball things and uh, half balls and I think we're going to glue these onto their shafts. And I'm going to be quite generous applying this epoxy because it doesn't really matter if it goes, uh, if it overruns a little bit it won't have it cause any problems. So 
So there's our first cup assembled. There's our second cup and hopefully we'll just have time to do the last one before this stuff sets. Okay, I think we'll give these 10 minutes to cure before I bring you back. So the final part that I've really been looking forward to is I've just got to attach these uh, cups now and then we can give it a blow and see if it actually spins round, fingers crossed, eh? Don't really think I need a lot of finesse here, just need to make sure we get as much glue inside here as possible. In fact, probably better if I did it that way, It'd get gravity on my side, wouldn't it? Doing my look, I'll probably put one the wrong way around. So I think I will put these, yeah, I think cups facing forward, I think. I don't think I care which way it spins round. Hopefully it shouldn't make any difference. To make the final assembly of our anemometer a little bit easier, I've gone ahead and I've made a little circuit board. Now this is actually constructed from some strip board, some Vera board. I think the final version, what I'll probably do is maybe make a little PCB for it, but I haven't decided yet. But I'm sure this will be good enough just for our prototyping. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pot this circuit board in some epoxy resin because I don't want water and dampness to get across these resistor values and they could cause problem so I made this little plastic potting box here which is basically going to just going to house this circuit board and we'll put some epoxy resin on it and uh, I'm now just going to go ahead I'm going to solder onto our LED here our infrared LED and also our photo transistor and then once we've done that we'll give it a quick test and then do the final assembly I've hooked up our infrared LED to a 5 volt power supply via its current limiting resistor here. And we can see that it's drawing approximately 10 milliamps from our power supply. So that was our design current, so it looks as though that's working properly. So finally we're just going to hook up our photo transistor. I've got to admit, speaking from experience, it's actually quite easy to actually wire these up the wrong way around, having just done that once. Well, fingers crossed now, when we actually introduce our infrared emitting diode to our photo transistor, we should get approximately 3.3 volts here on the voltmeter. So let's just try that. Okay, well, we get what we're getting. We're getting 3 volts, getting towards 3.1 volts. Well, that's quite close enough to a 3.3 logic level. That will work fine. Just move it away, it drops back to approximately zero. Move it up to it again, and 3 volts. And we can do that, really, very quickly. Right, I'm happy that that's actually working. Let's get gooey and pot this in some epoxy resin. Well, a slight change of plan. I think I've decided just to give this a paint in some conformal coating because this does actually dry pretty quickly. And uh, we'll probably still put some epoxy on here just to retain the wires. But yeah, I think this might be as good as anything. After about 10 minutes, our conformal coating is fully dried. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fix our circuit board here into this little tray that I 3D printed. Because this has got a couple of lugs at each side, which means I can just bolt the circuit board down and stop it flapping around in the breeze. So I'm just going to push that into here because it's designed to be quite a tight fit. But I am just going to put a little bit of glue on it just to retain it and maybe just to stop some of these wires flapping around. Now I'm going to use some of this UV setting glue. This is something which I discovered just last year and I think this is amazing stuff. It's really good in that you can actually set it instantly just by putting some UV light onto it. So I'm just going to use that just to provide a little bit of stability to some of the wiring. So I'm just going to put a drop on there. A drop on there. There. Just a drop there. And what I can do is literally shine a UV light on it. 
And that's it, this glue is now set. Well, there actually gets quite hot with the reaction. I'm also just going to glue these wires down again just so they make sure they don't get trapped anywhere. Again, that glue now is now fully hard. So having done all this preparation work and made this little wiring loom and our little potted circuit board, it should only take a few moments to assemble this and then we can give it a final test and actually see if all this hard work has paid off. Big fingers crossed here. So we've just got to remove a couple of these little platforms. So we'll take that off. Come on, come off. There we go. Now we've got to carefully pull off the encoder wheel here. Because this is just held on by friction. And now this top platform needs to come off. Okay, so that's a tight fit into there. Now we've got to put our encoder wheel back on. Now our bat bottom platform. Okay, that's just a bit tight on the bearing, so let's just make a, a very slight adjustment. So we've just created a little bit of uh, play there in the bearing. So that's now spinning a lot better. And now finally I've just got a little collar to put on here, which is just to retain the shaft and keep everything held together. Now annoying and my screw here is just catching the very edge of this box. Will it just tighten up a wee bit more? No, I might have to just get a shorter screw. That's annoying, isn't it? Have I got one? Well, it's close, but I think that'll be okay. And again, I think I'm just going to use a little dab of this UV adhesive just to keep some of these little cables out of the way and stop things getting uh, trapped. So I'll just put a little blob on there. And hit it with some UV. And that's done. He said bit more. Okay that's got it. I think I'll just put a dash more on here. And that should be good. 
And one thing about when you do use this adhesive, you don't want to leave it out in the sun, and I keep it in a cardboard box. This stuff is pretty expensive actually, I think it's about £15 for a bottle like this, but it's a huge bottle if you think how much super glue you might go through. That's typically like a pound for a little shot of super glue. I've had this for more than a year now, and I've used it quite a lot, and it's probably still two-thirds of the way full but yeah I kind of recommend these UV resins really good dead useful one thing that I'm kind of regretting is actually purchasing these plastic boxes now I actually bought these as a set and they were pretty much the cheapest thing that I could buy on Amazon and uh, they were very cheap I think I got a set of it was either six or eight and there were some smaller boxes like this one and some larger boxes well I should have looked at the pictures a little bit more carefully because these larger boxes are pretty tough actually but the good thing is they've got actually got four screw holes so the lids are actually held on by screws whereas these smaller boxes which I've used um, they're not actually held on by screws you've kind of got just a ridge here that it clips into and they really don't feel very positive when you actually put these things together now the other thing that is really horrible about these boxes is uh, the way that these plastic kind of knockout grommets are installed well that's a problem they're not actually what I would call knockouts they're kind of like well yeah a rubber bung is a better description but they don't fit particularly tightly they've got little gaps around them and uh, they don't really inspire confidence so I think we would get water ingress through them so I think I probably just cheaped out a little bit too much buying these boxes now you can actually buy boxes of uh, a similar size that do have screws on them and they've actually got true knockouts so rather than having rubber bungs they actually have plastic knockouts that you've got to drill out or just knock out with a screwdriver so I think I may at some point in the future I'm going to change these boxes out for something a little bit more solid because yeah they feel a bit weak and feeble I suppose I could just use these bigger boxes that would be fine but yeah as you see I designed it to fit inside this one so let's just see if it will go in Having fully assembled our anemometer, it would be rude to leave today before giving it a quick test. So let's give it a try. So it looks like our anemometer is producing some really nice output pulses here so I'm sure we'll have no problem measuring the wind speed. Well in next week's episode we're going to have a look at how we connect the anemometer to the, to the Pico board and we're also going to be looking at how we can determine the direction of the wind and we're going to do that using a grey code encoder. So until next time I think for today that'll do. Bye bye for now. Oops. Okay. Windy Miller, Windy Miller, sharper than a thorn. Like a mouse, he's spry and nimble when he grinds the corn. Like a bird, he'll watch the wind and listen for the sound, which says he has the wind he needs to make the sails go round. Phew, it's warm work being a miller.